Thank you very much for uh, attending and welcome to our home. Um, the lecture this week on my thoughts uh, titled Understanding Three Mitzvot. So this week on my thoughts I would like to examine three mitzvah commandments found in the Torah that challenge our logic and reason. Two are related to children and the third is related to God Almighty himself, hopefully. After we analyze them, we will have a greater idea and appreciation for the depth, relevance, and kindness of Torah and its laws. Now, the first mitzvah that I would like to discuss is connected to the only prayer that we recite daily, the only prayer that we have the Torah obligation to recite, the Shema Yisroh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The first paragraph in the Shema opens with the command, V'yahavta es Hashem and you shall love the Lord your God. Not just superficially. The prayer continues with the words, B'chol levavacha, with all of your heart, which alludes to both your good and evil inclinations. B'chol nafshacha, and with all your soul, which alludes to both your animal and godly soul. And b'chol ma'odecha, and with all of your might, which Rashi uh, states means, alludes to your money, or extend it to anything actually that you perceive as precious. Love is an emotion. So the question we have to ask is, how can we be commanded to love a deity that we cannot see and that we cannot truly know? We are not commanded to love our children. Even when it comes to our parents, the Torah only commanded us to honor and respect them. Nowhere in the Torah does it state that thou art commanded to love your parents. We do love our children, but that emotion seems to be innate, something which is shared by all of God's living creatures. Even more puzzling is that we are commanded in the Torah in the portion of Yisrael. It states there, V'yahavta l'riachu kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We can ask the same question again. How can we be commanded to love other people? After all, not all people are exactly lovable. Now, all of these questions can be answered in one statement. So why do we love our children? It is a trait that we have inherited from Adam Arishon, from first man. His, he fathered children and he loved them. And so he passed down that trait to us, all of his creation. The natural love that a parent feels towards their child, again, that we inherited. We love our children even before they are born. Now, Adam, first man, did not have any parents. He was not born in a natural fashion. He was created. Whereas in the beginning, when God created all other living things in creation, it was done as a one-step process. They were all created as living entities. However, when God created man, God first molded him into a lifeless form, a, a sort of mannequin. It was only when God blew into his nostrils the breath of life, a piece of himself. That was the moment when the good man came to life. So first man did not have human parents, but he did have a father. Adam's father was God Almighty himself. This created within mankind a natural love for their father, the creator of the universe. This love was real and tangible. It existed until the time when the Jews returned to the land of Israel to rebuild the second temple. The first temple was destroyed because of the sin of idol worship. This desire for idol worship, worship that does not truly exist in the world today. So since God created this world to be a place of bechira, free will, it would have necessitated that every positive commandment would have to be opposed by an equally powerful negative force. That being the case, when the desire to serve God existed tangibly in the world, there had to exist an equally opposing desire to serve idols, uh, much like a man who was torn between the love he feels for his wife and the attraction he may feel for his mistress. The rabbis of the Great Assembly, the Anshich Nesdagdola, felt that the Jewish nation could not overcome their desire for idol worship. So the Talmud tells us, that they fasted for three consecutive days. And then they asked God to remove or at least diminish the desire of idol worship in the world. He agreed. However, 
When God diminished and or removed the desire for idol worship, he was compelled to do the same for the natural love that mankind entertained towards their Father in heaven. God diminished this open and tangible love that mankind had felt towards him, but, but he did not remove it completely. It still resides naturally within the heart of each and every Jew, regardless of their religious affiliation. What we refer to as the Pintaliyid, the spark of the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, that resides within each and every one of us. This then is the reason that we have been commanded to love the Lord your God. It's a natural emotion. We just need to attach ourselves to it, much like turning on a television set. You may have one in your house, but you, but you only can see a picture when you plug it in and then turn it on. Now this answer can also be applied to the question of how can we expect it to via hafta l'reach l'komocha, to love your neighbor as yourself. Hasidus teaches us that there are three garments of the soul. Those garments are thought, speech, and action. Imagine if you had a friend and you loved him dearly, but he was a flashy dresser. You certainly love him, but you would never wear the clothes that he wears. In fact, sometimes you may even see them as offensive. We may experience the same negative feelings when we observe another Jew. We may not appreciate the character traits that they have chosen to clothe their soul in. That may be the case, but the soul that resides within their body, that pintaliid, is still a part of God Almighty himself and him, him you love. So then you can honestly say that you can love your neighbor as yourself. The second mitzvah that I would like to address is referred to in the Torah as the ben Sower Umorah, known as the rebellious son. The Torah in the book of Devarim in the portion of Kisetse states that if a man has a rebellious son, one who doesn't listen to kol aviv for kol imo, to the voice of his father nor to the voice of his mother, the Torah then states that his parents take him to the court and they declare to the elders of the city, our son is a wayward and, re and rebellious person. He does not listen to us and he has been a, both a glutton and a drunkard. And the Torah continues. And it says that all the men of the city shall then pelt him with, uh, to death with stones so that you will rid yourself of the evil in your midst. Well, sounds pretty harsh. This law seems very strange. For one, we are speaking about a 13-year-old boy in addition, for him to be charged for his actions, he must have been seen by at least two witnesses. The Torah tells us that he must have stolen money from his parents, in addition bought 50 dinars of meat, eating it rare outside of his father's house and in bad company. He must also have drunk at least a half of a lug of wine with his meal. What makes this law even more unusual is that all of Judaism is predicated on the concept of teshuva, repentance. We have a belief that anyone, anyone can change their evil ways at any time, and God Almighty will always accept their teshuva, their repentance. The Talmud tells us that a Baal tshuva, a repentant individual, is even greater than a tzaddik. In addition, if their teshuva is truly sincere, then they have the ability to transform all of their sins into mitzvot. So the question remains, why wouldn't we allow this young man the opportunity to grow up and hopefully find a proper path in life? The Talmud in Sanhedrin states that concerning the case of the rebellious son, in reality, it never actually occurred. If that was the case, then why did the Torah deem it necessary to tell us about this scenario? One reason given was to advise parents that they should learn to overcome their natural feelings of mercy and not refrain from disciplining their children whenever it's necessary. In addition, Menachem Medal of Kutz, the Kutzka Rebbe stated that the young man's sin is not so much that he is a sower, that he's rebellious. The gravity of his sin stems from the fact that he is a morer, a teacher. He is a leader, a negative influence to his peers. There is nothing more grievous in the eyes of heaven than causing other people to sin. 
If we look into the history of the world, we can gain a greater appreciation as to why God felt it necessary to include this scenario described in the Torah. So one of the main messages that Abram Abraham our father, spread throughout the world was that it was not acceptable for parents to sacrifice their children to idols. Something that was common, was a common occurrence during this time in world history. In fact, in Rome, it was not considered a capital offense if a parent killed their own child for any reason. From Abraham Ravino, from Abraham our father, we learn a great lesson in serving God. Even though Abraham had spent a great deal of his time and efforts trying to stop the practice of parents killing their children, still he did not question or even hesitate when God Almighty asked him to bring his son Yitzchak up as a human sacrifice. God's statement was worded as a request and not as a command, and yet <clears throat> Abraham's love and obedience to God overcame all reason and logic. As we read in the Torah, this request by God was only a test to show the world the extent of Avram Avinu's total love and commitment to God and to his wishes. You know, we need to learn from our father, Avram, that our service to God our Father in Heaven is not predicated on our logic. We are at best servants of the King. Even though God encourages us to understand His mitzvahs to the best of our ability, in the end, we must acknowledge that every mitzvah, large or small, represents Ratzon Hashem, the will of God. In that regard, all mitzvot are equal. There are still two important lessons that the Ben Sower Morer teaches us. The verse states that the young man did not listen to the voice of his father nor the voice of his mother. The Torah is telling us that if you have two parents that are both constantly yelling at their child, well, then the end result will be you will bring up a rebellious son. One of the parents has to back off and show kindness and patience to the child, though it may be difficult, much like Yitzchak, our father, showed with his son Asa. In addition, since people felt that they had the right to kill their own children, they even offered up their children to angry gods in the hope that it would act as a protection for the rest of their family. The Torah had to make a strong statement to counteract this practice. The Torah tells us that if you have a rebellious son, he can be killed, but not by you. It can only be administered through the Jewish court and through the testimony of witnesses. So once again, we see a mitzvah, which at first glance seems to be cruel and illogical. But upon closer investigation, we see just the opposite. It turns out to be an act of kindness rather than an act of cruelty. The third mitzvah that I would like to examine may well be the most difficult of all the laws of the Torah for us to understand. In the portion of Chayas so we read about Eliezer, the servant of Avram. He was ordered by his master to travel to Haran and bring back a bride for Yitzchok. Now Rashi in the portion of Toldos tells us that Rivka was only three years old when she married Yitzchok. That seems difficult to accept, especially since Yitzchok was 40 years old at the time. From this marriage, we also learn the law that a three-year-old girl is what they call Roy Labia, capable of having marital relations. When most people hear this statement, their, force, their face contorts as if they were sucking on a lemon. How can the Torah sanction a marital union with a young girl who is only three years old? When we read about the story of Eliezer, the servant of Ram, traveling to Haran to bring back a bride for Yitzchak, Rashi t there tells us that God arranged for Eliezer to experience what we call kafitza sadera, a shortening of the road. Miraculously, a journey that should have taken him 27 days, he was able to traverse in less than one day. Now, since nothing is an accident, what was the reason for this miracle? The Rebbe stated that on that day, Rivka had just turned three years old. She was referred to as a rose amongst the thorns. And since it was her birthday and she had just turned three, there existed the possibility that she could now be abused by one of the men of the city. So God orchestrated 
that the rose should be plucked immediately from the thorn bush before she could be tainted. You know, we read in the portion that Rashi testifies that she had not yet been defiled, as he states in the portion of Chayasar, where Rashi comments on the word, Basula, virgin, which he goes to the trouble to explain, refers to both natural or unnatural sexual relations. From Rashi's descriptive words, we can ascertain that at this time and place, it was not unusual for a pedophile to take advantage of very young girls. Hence, the necessity for expediency. She had to be extracted without delay. But still, Yitzchak was 40 years old and Rivka was only three years old. Why would he marry such a young girl? If we examine all the facts, we may find that all of this was based on kindness and necessity. For various reasons, he had no choice but to remove her immediately from her unholy environment. However, the only way that she would have been allowed to live with him was with marriage. Since after the age of three, the Torah does not allow a young girl to be alone with a strange man. This is referred to as the laws of Yichud, again, being alone with a woman. Our sages tell us that our forefathers kept all the commandments in the Torah. So let us look at the relationship that would have existed between Yitzchak and Rivka. In the Torah's description of the incident at the well and, to her, and her recorded conversations, it's obvious that she was an intelligent and warm child. However, she was still a child. Imagine she was away from home probably for the first time. She was now in a totally different environment on all levels, geographically, socially, financially, and spiritually. She, as any young child, would have still needed love and affection. By affection, I mean hugging. We know that what, what a difference hugs can make in the life of any person, but especially a young child. Since they were, they were married, he was now permitted to hold her hand when she would be ill, they would be permitted to eat alone together, sit and talk privately together, and become closer than most married couples could ever hope to become. As it states in the Torah in the portion of Chayasura, that the spies of Amimelech, the king of the Pelishtim, saw them when Rivka was already older. Mitzachek is what the Torah describes, which comes from the Hebrew word laughing together. Their relationship only grew as she matured. Yitzchak became not only her husband, but her teacher, her comforter, her friend, her mentor, a tower of strength and dignity. We read in the Torah that even the king, Abimelech, came, came to him to make a peace treaty. He was Yitzchak, the paradigm of discipline. He projected confidence without conceit. Rivka was fortunate to become a part of his life from such a young age. The Torah states that Yitzchak was 40 years old when he married Rivka. In Pirkei Avot, in the Ethics of the Fathers, at the end of chapter 5, it states, Ben Arboim Labina, at the age of 40, one acquires understanding. It would have, he would have needed Bina, understanding, to patiently wean Rivka from a house of idolatry to living in a house dedicated to the service of God Almighty. As far as their physical connection, uh, you know, the fact that they were married did not necessitate that they consummate the marital act. There are religious couples that for various reasons choose to postpone their physical union. We must realize that we are talking about an illustrious individual, a tzaddik, whose greatest attribute was discipline. I'm certain that the last thing on Yitzchak's mind was having marital relations with his three-year-old wife. I do believe that all that God orchestrates in our lives have far-reaching benefits. God always tests us to our weaknesses, not our strengths. Yitzchak was a no-nonsense individual, and he was now forced to develop patience and sensitivity. He had to learn how to interact not only with a young child, but a female who was now his wife. He recognized in her the soul of his mother, Sarah. Rashi tells us that while Sora was alive, there were three miracles that occurred daily in her merit. The dough that she baked stayed fresh all week. The candles that she lit burned continuously, again, from one week to the next. 
In addition, there was a cloud that rested daily above her tent. These same three miracles were all repeated in the tabernacle, the house of God, that the Jews built in the desert. It was seen as a replica of the tent of Sarah, our mother. When Rivka entered his mother's tent, all three of these miracles returned. How could he not love her? In reality, Yitzchak became a single parent. He was compelled to accept all the challenges that being a single parent present. Without his knowledge, I believe that God was preparing Yitzhak to be a single parent to his son, Esau. Esau would have been a challenge to any parent, but especially to a man of discipline, such as Yitzhak. He was able to change his nature in order to be able to give to his son, Esau, what he needed, just as he did with his young wife, Rivka, when she came into his life. So what we have learned is that since the laws of Yichud begin from the time that a young girl reaches the age of three years old, that from that age until death, a woman is protected by God Almighty. The law states that starting from the age of three, from the age of three on, no man, it makes no difference whether they are a beloved friend or even a relative, they cannot be left alone with your young daughter. She is protected by the laws of the Torah. After all, who is a pedophiler? Often someone whom you perceive as a loving and kind friend to your daughter. Someone who you might feel comfortable leaving your precious daughter alone with. After all, he seems to truly care about her. And he does, but not in the manner that you would want. If you follow the laws of the Torah, then your young daughter is protected from being abused. Since from the age of three on, she cannot be left alone with any man other than a father, grandfather, or brother. I hope that after we have examined these three difficult mitzvot, we have gained a greater appreciation of the logic and kindness that Torah teaches us. Though many think the Torah and its laws are antiquated, we witness just the opposite. The world around us may constantly change, but human nature somehow always remains the same, as does the necessity of the instruction manual that we call the Torah. And with that knowledge, let us hope to help to usher in the coming of Mashiach Tzikainu quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. And God bless and be well and be safe, be happy, be successful in all of your endeavors. Again, God should bless you with only good. Shabbat Shalom. Again, thank you.